This is from the Nidana Samyutta. And this is how the Buddha figured out the links of dependent origination. Monks, before my awakening, well, I was still a bodhisattva, not yet fully awakened. It occurred to me, alas, this world has fallen into trouble in that it's born, ages, and dies. It passes away and is reborn. Yet it does not understand this escape from suffering headed by aging and death. Now, when will an escape be discerned from this suffering headed by aging and death? Now, what the Buddha was actually doing was asking himself these difficult kinds of questions and then trusting his intuition to give him the answer. Don't sit with your legs crossed, please. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does aging and death come to be? By what is aging and death conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is birth, aging and death comes to be. Aging and death, aging and death has birth as its condition. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does aging and death come to be? By what is birth conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is habitual tendency, birth comes to be. Birth has habitual tendency as condition. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists does habitual tendency come to be? By what is habitual tendency conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is clinging, habitual tendency comes to be. Habitual tendency has clinging as its condition. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists does clinging come to be? By what is clinging conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is craving, clinging comes to be. Clinging has craving as its condition. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does craving come to be? By what is craving conditioned? Then, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is feeling, craving comes to be. Craving has feeling as its condition. Then, it occurred to me, when what exists, does feeling come to be? by what is feeling conditioned. Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me 
a breakthrough by wisdom. Now you see, each one of these links has wisdom in it. And that's the definition of wisdom, is the links of dependent origination and how they work. When there is contact, feeling comes to be. Feeling has contact as its condition. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does contact come to be? By what is contact conditioned? Then, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there are the six sense bases, contact comes to be. Contact has the six sense bases as its condition. Then it occurred to me, <coughs> when what exists, do the six sense bases come to be? By what are the six sense bases conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is mentality, materiality, the six sense bases come to be. The six sense bases have mentality, materiality as, it, as their condition. <clears throat> then it occurred to me when what exists does mentality materiality come to be by what is mentality materiality conditioned then through careful attention there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom when there is consciousness mentality materiality comes to be Mentality, materiality has consciousness as its condition. Then it occurred to me, when what exists, does consciousness come to be? By what is consciousness conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there are formations, consciousness comes to be. Consciousness has formations as its condition. Then it occurred to me, when what exists, do formations come to be? By what are formations conditioned? Then, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is ignorance, formations comes to be. Formations have ignorance as their condition. Thus, ignorance, with ignorance as condition, formations come to be. With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality comes to be. With mentality, materiality as condition, what's next? The sixfold base comes to be. With the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be. With contact as condition, Feeling comes to be. With feeling as condition. Craving. With craving as condition. Craving. With, with clinging as condition. Habitual. habitual tendency comes to be. With habitual tendency as condition. Birth. Comes to be. With birth as condition, <laughs> aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair.
comes to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Origination, origination, monks, in regard to things unheard before that arose in my vision, knowledge, wisdom, and true knowledge, and radiance. Now we're going to go into the cessation. Then, monks, it occurred to me when what does not exist does aging and death not come to be. With the cessation of what does the cessation of aging and death come about? Then, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there's no birth, aging and death does not come to be. With the cessation of, age, of birth comes the cessation of aging and death. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, does birth not come to be? By the cessation of what does the cessation of birth come about? When through careful attention there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom, then there is no ex uh, habitual tendency, birth does not come to be. With the cessation of habitual tendency comes the cessation of birth. When there is no clinging, uh, habitual tendency does not come to be. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendency. When there's no craving, clinging does not come to be. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. When there's no feeling, craving does not come to be. With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. When there's no contact, feeling does not come to be. With the cessation of contact comes cessation of feeling. Now, I've, I've been talking about seeing the slightest little movement of mind's attention and relaxing and staying with the quiet mind. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the cessation of suffering. <clears throat> when there are no six sense bases, contact does not come to be, so it was said. With the cessation of the six sense bases comes the cessation of contact. When there's no uh, mentality, materiality, the, the six sense bases do not come to be. With the cessation of, the, of mentality, materiality comes the cessation of the sixfold base. When there is no consciousness, mentality, materiality does not come to be with the cessation of consciousness comes a cessation of mentality, materiality. When there's no formations, consciousness does not come to be. With the cessation of formations comes a cessation of consciousness. When there's no ignorance, formations do not come to be. With the cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of formations. 
Thus, with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes cessation of formations. With the cessation of formation comes the cessation of Okay. With the cessation of consciousness, cessation of? With the cessation of mentality, materiality, cessation of? With the cessation of the sixfold base, cessation of? With the cessation of contact, cessation of? With the cessation of feeling? Cessation of? With the cessation of craving, cessation of? With the cessation of clinging, cessation of? With the cessation of the habitual tendencies, cessation of? With the cessation of birth, cessation of? Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and Cessation, cessation, thus monks in regard to things unheard before that arose in me, vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and radiance. So this is, uh, the Buddha spent quite a while going over this. And because he did that, why didn't he become enlightened right away? because he knew it intellectually. He had to see it for himself. And when he did, then he, he became a Buddha. So he had this knowledge. This is how it works. Now you have that knowledge. This is how it works. Now, you have to 6R and purify your mind enough until you become successful with the practice and attain Nibbana. It's pretty easy and straightforward. <laughs> so there was a question that, that came up at one of the interviews today. And everybody says, find the right teacher for you. And the Buddha told us how to do that. 47, 62, too far. Wasn't. Okay, this is what you look for in a teacher. Okay, this is what the Buddha says. Monks, one who does not know and see as it really is aging and death, its origin, cessation, and way leading to the cessation should search for a teacher in order to know this as it really is. And then he goes through all of the links of dependent origination. Their origin, their cessation, and way leading to the cessation. That's how you should search for a teacher in order to know this as it really is. The links of dependent origination is the backbone of the teaching. It's the thing that keeps everything right. I uh, studied a lot with a lot of different teachers and they were very big on saying that if you really want to understand dependent origination, it's really, really complicated. 
Mahasi Sayadaw wrote a book on dependent origination and at the start of his book he said, this is really, really complicated. And as you read what he had to say, it was really, really complicated. But the thing is, this is a practical way of looking at how mind works. This is practical. And it's not that hard to understand. When you're seeing it for yourself. But he was taught, and a lot of the teachers before him was taught, that it was very, very difficult. <coughs> and if you look in the Visuddhimagga, it tries to break it up into three days the past, the present, and the future. And that really complicates things. And one of the things that uh, Buddha Gosa said about dependent origination, it was like carrying the weight of an entire ocean on your head. That's how difficult it is. But, as you start to understand, you're not going to see all of the links at once. <coughs> I had a student years ago, she, she uh, played for the uh, London Sin Symphony Orchestra, and she was talking about giving up doing that because she wanted to understand dependent origination. And I told her, no, don't do that. There's nothing wrong with you being creative with your instrument. And there are artists that, that kind of try to do the same thing. They think that, well, if you're going to do the meditation, you can't be creative anymore. Well, the, create, the, the artistry that comes out of you from doing the meditation, you become much better and more, more and more creative when you're doing the meditation. You do it with joy in your mind. There was an artist that we had come from Colombia. And he was very famous. I mean, he was selling stuff all over the world. But he was only using brown, black, white, and gray. Those are the only four colors he was using. And it was kind of depressing. And I asked him, when did this start to happen for you, that you were just using these down colors? And he said, well, two years ago, my wife was, uh, she had cancer and she died. And ever since then, I've just been able to use these colors because that's the way he was seeing the world. He was seeing in browns and blacks and whites and grays. After a short retreat, I don't, I don't even think it was a full 10-day retreat. I think it was seven days. He went home and he started uh, taking pictures of his artwork. And all of a sudden there's these yellows and greens and blues and reds. And it was wonderful. People that are depressed generally just see depressing colors. And I had another student that she, that's the only color she had in her wardrobe. She showed me all of the different 
things that she had, and it was like depressing, just looking in at, at her wardrobe. And I told her, no, no more. There's two things that you have to do. One, she read five newspapers a day, which is, I don't know how anybody could get through that. And she had all of these depressing colors. So I told her, I, I told her she, she couldn't do the retreat until she went out and got some color. And she got some yellows and greens and happy colors. And when she started sitting, all of a sudden, she started progressing very fast. And she didn't feel so depressed anymore. And uh, getting her to stop reading five newspapers, I can't even get through one. In uh, Malaysia, they had one, one day a week, I think it was on a Wednesday, they had one page that was happy news. And that's better than looking at the comics, for crying out loud, some of the stories that you get to read. Be careful what you put in front of your mind. Uplifting, happy, is what you want to develop. And it makes it a lot easier to smile and it makes it a lot easier to have fun. So it's a real important aspect of the teaching. Yes, this can be incredibly complicated if you make it that way, but what's your perspective? When you first start, you're really, all you're gonna see is feeling Craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth and sorrow and lamentation and all of that stuff. But as you start using the six R's, you start being able to recognize these things, especially the craving. And that tension and tightness in your mind. Now if you don't, if you let go of the craving, then clinging won't arise. And if clinging won't arise, your emotional, habitual tendency won't arise. And if that doesn't arise, there's not going to be any birth of action, and there's not going to be any sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, or despair. But as you go deeper, you'll start seeing, well, there's some how contact works. Now actually, when you're doing the meditation, you don't see six sense doors. You only see one sense door at a time, right? So you can take that one out. You see mentality, materiality. So that is recognizable. The consciousness that's right before mentality, materiality, is the potential for the consciousness to arise. But there has to be something that uh, connects with it. And that is a mentality, materiality. And then you'll see the contact and you'll see the feeling. But when you notice each of these links, there is a tiny bit of the Four Noble Truths in it. Okay? There is um, the contact. And one of the sense doors arises, that's the mentality, materiality, and then the feeling, and then the craving, and then the clinging. And as you keep 
getting more and more quiet with your mind, then you're starting to let go of these links of dependent origination until finally there's not even any consciousness that arises. So feeling, perception, and consciousness disappear. And you don't even know that you're in that state until you come out. Now, when you come out, depending on the sharpness of your mindfulness, you're going to see little tiny bubbles, dots, slashes, dashes, whatever you want to call them. Everybody sees it in a little different way. But there's this arising, passing away very, very, very quickly. And that is the links of dependent origination. So what happened when you got into the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness? It's like on the blackboard, you just cleaned it off. There's nothing. And then when you see these little tiny links starting to come up, you're seeing how dependent origination arises. And as you go deeper into the uh, in, into the different levels of awakening, you'll see it more and more clearly. Now, when you get to be a Saktagami, you're going to see twice as many little bumps. So it's you're going through dependent origination a couple times. And when you get to be an Anagami, you'll start to see it three times. And you'll start recognizing more and more of dependent origination with your daily activities. You'll see how it works. There's a lot of oh wows that happen. And <clears throat> when you get to be an arahat, you see it completely clearly with deep understanding. So that's why in Burma, the, the uh, Sayada that was teaching just reciting dependent origination over and over again, forwards and backwards and whatever ways they did it, uh, he had a lot of people that were successful by doing that because of their understanding of this backbone. the essence of the Buddha's teaching. Each link has the Four Noble Truths in it. <clears throat> and when you let go of one condition, then the other conditions don't arise behind it. So you, you get to have a good, deep understanding of how this process works. Now, <clears throat> there's another section of this it's at the start. And The Buddha said, I will teach you the wrong way to practice and the right way to practice. Listen to that and attend closely. Yes, venerable sir, the monks replied. And what monks is the wrong way? With ignorance as condition, formations come to be. With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. Why is this the wrong way? Because you're just looking at how all of this causes more and more pain as you go through all of the links. 
And what is the right way with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance? Cessation of these other things arise. So that's the third noble truth. That's what he was trying to get across all the time with his teaching. Focus on the cessation of suffering. The meditations that cause pain to arise a lot don't allow that kind of understanding. Because when the pain starts coming up, that's, that hooks your mind in. That's, there's just aversion there. There's just this unclear feeling because there is no letting go of craving. When I was in uh, Florida and I was teaching quite a bit, going to, well, every, every day I went to a different prison and I, I was teaching them meditation and that sort of thing. And the, one, the man that was inviting me to do all of this with him arranged that we would give a one week retreat at the prison. It started at eight o'clock in the morning and went to eight o'clock at night. <clears throat> and they started to really understand. Now these are people that are murderers and, and thieves and nasty people to start off with. And the first thing I had them do when we, when we gave a retreat was they had to smile for one day all the time. And I told them that they had to laugh. Now they wanted to learn uh, mindfulness of breathing because everybody wants to learn mindfulness of breathing. And I told them, no, I want you to learn how to lovingly accept whatever arises in the present. And there was this guy that he was always getting thrown in the hole because he was beaten up on the, on the guards and stuff because they did nasty things to him so he would get even and then he'd get thrown in the hole. And I, st I started... Uh, taking him as my project for that one week. And I talked to him a lot about how anger causes all kinds of problems for you, so don't, don't get into that. Wish other people well. And gratitude. So right near the end of the retreat, the guards decided that they were going to cause him some problems. So they went into his cell and just threw out everything that he, his, uh, everything he had in the, in the cell. And it was real special to him, a lot of that stuff, because it was notes and letters from, from their loved ones and that sort of thing. And they just threw him out. And they were watching real closely because they thought they were going to get to beat him up with sticks and stuff. And he just stood there and watched them, and he was smiling. And as they walked out, he said, I sincerely wish you a good day. And they didn't, the guards didn't know what to do with that. They were ready to, to get into some heavy-duty action. And he changed his personality in a short period of time. It was only about a month. So much that before being in solitary confinement, now he was able to get outside and work in the garden. 
And he started really liking that. And, and he was always talking to the other inmates about it's better to be nice and gentle than it is to be rough and <coughs> harmful. <coughs> and some of, the, some of the inmates understood it so well that they actually were starting to get into jhanas. Now this is absolutely unheard of in the prison system. The prison, pr prison system is supposed to be difficult. And it's, it's a matter of your perspective. You want to make it difficult, you can do that and get beat up all the time and stabbed and all of this kind of stuff. You can do that if you want or not. And they actually started asking me to send them some of these books. And right after I left the area, I moved here to Missouri, uh, the reason I moved here was somebody donated 1,200 acres of land to me. And I decided not to take it after being there for a little while because it was deep in the forest. And just to get some, say, a loaf of bread and, and a, a gallon of milk, Sometimes it would take five hours to get there and back because trees fell down and then you had to you had to have a chainsaw with you and cut it and get it off the road so you could continue on. And it was just too difficult to build anything there because it was so deep in the forest so I gave that one up. Then we got this piece of land. Anyway, uh, one of the teachers was a Zen teacher. And he was, he was teaching before I came along. And the way he was teaching all of the inmates and he did this just about every time he talked about meditation. And he would slap his hand down on the, on the ground and he'd say, life is suffering. And after I heard that for a few times, I started going, well, there, there's more to that than just life is suffering. I said, why don't you direct your mind to the cessation of the suffering? And that went, around, went along real well. They, they, they liked that. And they were real sad when I left. But right after I left, the uh, chaplain arranged for all the people that were doing meditation to have their own area or their own building to be in. Now the thing with being in the prisons is everybody's yelling. They're making a lot of noise. And they wanted quiet time. So they finally got a, a, a building that was reasonably quiet that they could sit in meditation. And I've since heard that it's become more and more popular all through uh, Florida. And uh, there were some times when I first came here, I went to uh, no. Uh, the high security prison, Pelosi, Potosi, that's what it is. And this is where there's really nasty guys that have been in there for a long time and they've been 
working out and they're they're like super muscle men and, and that sort of thing and I, when I went in there and talked to them about loving kindness I said you know you guys got it made you got a place to stay you got clothes you got food you don't have to work you have a lot of time that you could be doing the meditation I said, I, mean, I might even think about doing something wrong so I could have that kind of thing. And they said, oh, you don't want to be in here. <laughs> I said, I believe you. Because they have, they have gangs and stuff, and they, they do all kinds of nasty things occasionally to each other. But I proved the point that even people that are thrown in jail, and they're very nasty people to start off with, they know that they're suffering, and they want to find some way out of the suffering. So they paid attention. And I, I guess I was, we did uh, six or eight retreats there which was uh, the, the uh, head counselor and the guy that was running the, the prison, they called me in two or three times and said, what are you doing with these people? People are walking around smiling. I said, yeah. Isn't it great? And they said, we don't trust that. Why Why are they smiling? They're, they're figuring, they're going to do something. And, and they're, they're real. They're, and I said, no, no, you watch. So after about a year of this kind of practice, uh, I left and came here, and uh, they're still carrying on now, and they're, they are following more and more of the Buddha's teaching. So that when you teach by example, that's when people start to notice. I have one student that she is a born again. She'll get somebody and she'll start talking and she'll talk for two hours. And they, they walk away exhausted because they have given too much at one time. <clears throat> but they seem to be catching on in India. They sent her to India because there's a big need for real Buddhists. A lot of the Buddhist monks in India are not, not real Buddhist monks. And they're more interested in getting money and that sort of thing than they are teaching. But she's, she's starting to make it more and more popular. And they're, they're putting her on um, radio and uh, television for short, short little bursts of Buddhism. So she is the thing that uh, made her a special student was her understanding of dependent origination. She, re she saw the, uh, the truth of it, and she just keeps going, delving deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And I was at a Thai conference where there was 300 Thai, and I took her with me 
And one day I, I went in and had some breakfast and I didn't see her and I'm thinking, oh, we got to be careful with this. Thai don't like the idea of women being educated. Not in Buddhism. The monks really don't like that. And she got a hold of one of these big monks that's really, really popular. And she's telling him how dependent origination works. So I saw that she was waving her hands and doing her teaching. And I thought, oh boy, I got to go take care of this. This is not good. And as soon as I walked up to the monk, he turned away from her, stared me straight in the face, and he said, Why are you teaching the higher teaching to this woman? And I said, Because she understands it. And he got mad and walked away. <laughs> But I get criticized for teaching the proper thing, in the proper way. Isn't that something? Was she in robes at the time? Yeah. She was in, in uh, purple robes. And the Thai don't like that idea because purple is, purple is supposed to be royal colors. <laughs> anyway. I, I get accused of being a sexist, and I'm not a sexist. I teach everybody the same. She's more sexist than I am. And I told her that, and she, she had to agree with it. But there are certain rules that we have to follow. And she was a seminary. And that meant that she, she was offering whatever food was offered, she would bring it to me and uh, take care of my sandals. When I took them off, she would put, put them in some place where they wouldn't got, get stolen, which happens every now and then. And uh, the women bhikkhunis who are not very well educated at all in Buddhism. They're more interested in saving animals and things like that. Uh, they would see that she was taking care of me. And they thought that I was really a bad person because uh, they try to gang up on me and say, why are you making her do that? I'm not making her do it. If you were, if he, she was a male, she would be doing exactly the same thing. That's the advantage of a monk, having a seminar to, to help with things that needed to be done. So, and whenever I ordain anyone, whether it's a female or a male, I become their spiritual father. And if they have any kind of problem at all, I will help solve it. Uh, sometimes there's medicines that need to be I need to make sure that they have the right kind of medicines if they need it. Or uh, the, sometimes it's, it's foods. Sometimes some, some uh, ladies will come and be seminary and they're, they're very much vegetarian. So we have to make sure that they have the right kind of food and they don't get sick from it. So um, I take care of them. That's my responsibility to them. And I take care of the bhikkhunis 
as well as the bhikkhu, or, or not bhikkhunis, the samaneri as well as the samanera. I treat them in the same way. And um, the, it, it's not very well organized in this country. Many of the women, they want to become bhikkhunis and be equal to the monks. Well, when I became a monk, I was a junior monk. I wasn't equal to a sayada. And I had to do all kinds of stuff as a young monk. And I was, always, I was supposed to always be at the end of the line for food. And sometimes when we got to the, they got to the end of the line, there wasn't much food left. Sometimes it was just rice. Okay. So. Over a few days, you, you, it, there's other kinds of food that are left over that you can get into so you can have a balanced meal. So, one of the hardest things for me to do when I first became a monk was to accept, accept stuff that was given to me. Because a lot of the stuff I didn't want, I didn't need, I don't want to carry this stuff around with me. But I learned that I could accept with this hand and find somebody that needed it with this hand. So I would just switch over and give it away. I don't care about material things, not so much. And I, I taught David over a period of time that you don't need to worry about where money is coming from. Money comes when it's needed. And there were times that he would come and he would say, uh, you're only, you only have enough money for two months and this, then you're going to have to sell this place. And I'd say, eh, okay, so what? And then a very short time later, somebody would send a whole bunch of money so that we could continue on. And now people are, are starting to send on a regular basis. We don't ask for anything. We don't ask them for money or donations. But we allow them to give if they see that there's an advantage of what's being taught here. As a monk, my only concern is teaching Dhamma. That's all I'm interested in. I'm not a, a real strong educated person. But because of the direct practice that I have, I sound like a real educated person. <laughs> when I was going to school, I had dyslexia. And they didn't know what dyslexia was when I was going to school, because I went, I went to school in the 50s. And they'd write something on the board, and the only way I could get it correctly was copy it on a piece of paper. I had to do it letter by letter, because the letters got jumbled up, and I couldn't, couldn't uh, differentiate. To this day, if I'm writing something, 
I have real trouble between B's and D's. And that's why I have a, a software that, that reads back whatever I type. And then when I hear it, I know that there's a mistake. Okay, I can fix that one then. But just looking at, at things, even when I'm reading, sometimes the words start moving around. And I'll read them in the wrong order or whatever. It's kind of weird. But this is why I started uh, reading the suttas out loud to people. Because I wanted to overcome the dyslexia. And it worked for the most part. I still have days when everything gets moved around a little bit, but anyway. So I wanted to give you this, um, in, in this book here, in the Samyut Nikaya, there are 84 discourses on dependent origination. And it's real interesting the the different stories that there there is in about each, a lot of the different uh, suttas and dependent origination. And just remember that the. Uh, the backbone of the teaching is dependent arising. And as you start going deeper into your practice, you will understand this more and more easily as you go. Okay? So, do you have any questions? Do you have a box of those books here? Or so we, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh. We got some somewhere. I, I think they're in the library. I don't know, in the uh, dining hall. Dining hall. You're talking about this book? Yeah. Back. Okay. okay, back there. You, you haven't figured that out yet? Is it sitting with your eyes closed? Yeah, that works real good when you're doing your walking meditation. Close your eyes. When you say guarding the sense door, is that the same question? Yes, it's basically the same thing. It means seeing the sense door and not getting, start thinking about that. That's what it actually means. Letting go of distractions of thinking about while you're at one of the sense doors. Pay attention to what that sense door is doing. Can you tell me exactly how the ear works? No. Why? I don't understand that well. Well? Why don't you use that as an object of meditation and try to see <coughs> how it happens? What happens first? What happens after that? What happens after that? Do that with all the sense doors. That's being restrained at the sense door. It's paying attention to the sense door without a lot of thinking about and distraction. It all comes down to distractions. Okay, and being able to see how the process works. I know exactly how every hindrance 
arises. What happens first, what happens after that? I can tell you exactly. But that comes from watching it closely. Okay? And not in the book. No, no. From direct experience. Well, as it comes up, you don't just pick one and say, I'm just going to watch this all day. Oh, okay. So you're observing to see what comes up. <clears throat> right. You have to have sharper mindfulness. That's why I try to get you to smile. It sharpens your mindfulness up so much that you're able to see tiny little movements and see how it actually occurs. I don't know if this question makes sense, but um, the first one is called formations. Formations are only potential for them to arise, just like consciousness is just potential. Well, right, it's, it's body, speech, and mind, but that has to have something to yeah. kick it off. Yeah. It seems to me like consciousness really is like a flashlight, just lighting things up, but there's, no, there's nothing to light up. Until there's yeah. Nama Rupa. Yeah. <coughs> So, you can see it. Another question. Have you finished this one? Um, we have consciousness. Um, general, in general, and then um, the contact is a reference to a specific consciousness from each sense base. So we have, we have consciousness preceding um, um, the six percent spaces. Are we talking about two different kinds of consciousness? Well, what does it say with um, the first part of the uh, destruction of suffering? How do all those consciousnesses arise? Uh, um, through, uh, you have to have you have to have a good working eye. There has to be color and form, and then that eye consciousness arises. And it's the same with every one of the sense doors. But it's not one consciousness arising, it's over. They happen fast. Yeah. But the, the magnificent thing about dependent origination after you attain Nibbana is you're seeing each one of those links arise and pass away very quickly. You're seeing each one. So when you're at uh, infinite consciousness and you start seeing individual consciousnesses rise and pass away, that's, that's pretty good because that's a hundred thousand arising, passing away of ear consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
It happens really fast and you get to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. But when you get to neither perception or non-perception and you get into the quiet mind, you start seeing individual links. That means one twelfth of one consciousness. So you're really sh making your mindfulness sharp to be able to see this. And you have to be just with it without thinking. Well, no. of course it's without thinking. Thinking is so slow, it's unbelievable. That's why the intellectuals, they think they're really hot with I understand the Buddha's teaching. No, they don't. Because they don't, they don't even, they're not even able to recognize the hindrance when it comes up and catches them. Yeah, they see the but, but what happens when you start doing the practice? You get to see that pretty quick. And you start seeing more and more subtle differences. It's one of the reasons why it gets to be fun. Because you can see this stuff on your own. That's why you have oh wows, because you finally realize it and you go, oh wow, look at that. In order for I consciousness to arise, right. you have to have good working I, you have to have color and form, and then the I consciousness arises. Yeah, I get that part. But the, the well, that's the answer to what you're asking. you get deep enough in the meditation, it will make more sense. And you'll see. So subconsciousness is consciousness. Um, it's the potential, but it has to have something that causes it to arise. Like the, the sense, the That's why it's only the potential for the consciousness to arise. fire there before the light, before you strike the flint. But it's there as soon as you strike it. Yeah. There's nothing there you can see, but something happens after. We all want to see this stuff. I want to see this. Yeah, you will, eventually. But the brilliance of this is not the seeing of that, it's the equanimity that you get and the non-identification that you get with it. Yeah. Seeing that there's nobody there. Yeah, there's it's no... It's just stuff. It's just stuff, it's part of a process, that's all it is. That's all dependent origination is, is part of a process. We are. Uh, computer robots. You would have known what the brain rate was and what, what the um, granularity was and the bell was. So. Sounds pretty digital to me. Well, it's real interesting when you're able to start seeing this on your own. But you're teaching yourself all along to be able to do it. 
And that's where the fun comes in. Because you're doing it yourself. And then you run across somebody that has about the same experience. It's real fun to talk about it. Okay, so why don't we share some merit? <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.